If you want to follow any of the readings in your Bible, I shall give you the ones in advance that we're going to go to. There are a few others, obviously, that I'll mention in passing and be quoting because I've written, written uh, parts of them down. But there's 1 Peter, uh, chapter 1, verses 15 to 19, which is our main reading. And then we'll be, look, we'll be reading from 1 Peter, chapter 4, so not far to go. Uh, we're looking at verses 3 to 5, and then Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. So just the three that we'll actually be uh, referring to, but I'll be starting obviously with the one in one Peter 1. I would say that I count it a privilege to, to come and minister to the people of God at any time, however many are, are present. At, that's not the point at the end of the day, because Scripture does say where two or three are gathered together. Um, and of course, it's, it's, it's there ultimately being recorded for people to pick up on, catch up on, on the net. So all those who desire to hear, all those who need to hear will hear uh, what God is saying this evening. I am simply a vessel who is, uh, who is called to actually uh, bring that word and indeed everyone and anyone who stands up here that is it. Uh, we are more we're oracles for God, oracles of God, so to speak. And uh, the desire have got, has got to be to share whatever He has laid on our heart. Um, so it's a privilege. It's a privilege. And uh, also, if we've been given the talent, and we will we will speak on that a little later. We'll cover that. We've been given a talent by the Lord, whatever it might be, we've, we've got to be true to it, whether it be standing here or whether, whatever, we've got to be true to it, we've got to make use of it. Um, so today is uh, session three, of, of course, of the three sessions that uh, started some weeks ago, um, entitled Our Calling, and of course I divided them into three. Um, we had responsibilities, handling difficulties, um, and of course today will be reasons for faithfulness. I did flag that up some time ago that that would be the third one. And I also said that it may actually end up being split. I have got a split in it depending on how, what we're doing for time. I have got a split in it. My desire is uh, not to be as long as I was last time. <laughs> um, but of course uh, we'll see how that goes. But if it comes to it, there is a split whereby uh, I can pick it up on pick it up on another day because I did say from the word go that I thought the session three might be a bit too long um, to do all in one, but we'll see how things go. So session three today, reasons for faithfulness. Um, I mean, when we did the other two sessions, of course the, there was the responsibility, as I said before, uh, session one, our responsibility towards God and each other, having been saved by grace through faith in the shed blood of our Lord Jesus. We noted that we've been bought with his blood and are no longer our own. Um, we belong to him, he owns us. And we saw something of what that means for us now. What it means for our lives now, and of course what it means going on into eternity forever. And of course, uh, session two, as I said, looked at what we should be like and do when problems and differences arise within the church. It's interesting that part of our conversation prior to the service involved yet another instance of, a, of an issue arising somewhere else, um, another church, but of course it doesn't seem like that was handled terribly well. So it's very, very important, brothers and sisters, that we do. Uh, stick to what God has, has highlighted when, when these things come about. Stick to the whole of his word. He's, he's given it all there. He's given us it all there. It's there to see. And uh, we stick to it. If we stick to it, uh, things will work out well. When we don't, then obviously problems come ar arise. Some real problems can arise or escalate, um, I would say. would be the better way of putting it. Uh, you know, differences will arise within the church, whether it's personality clashes or wrongs that come about from scriptural interpretation. Um, it, these things will come, but if, again, if we sort them out properly, uh, the, there shouldn't be a, a, an issue. What we should never have, um, 
happened is something of what happened to a, uh, a pastor that I heard about not that long ago. Um, now he preached on, a, on, I don't know what the subject was, but he, um, he was highlighting something in scripture that he believed he had complete support for because that it, there it was in the word of God. Um, you know, can't argue with that, you'd think. But apparently after he made this scripture based point, um, not only did he face a bit of hostility post-service, um, but it was actually followed by damage being done to his children's garden toys overnight and his tires being slashed. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous when it, gets, when it gets to that, where people being given the word of God result to that. One ends up wondering exactly whose they are really mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, that, that sort of extremity. You know, I'd, I'd dare to suggest we're talking about church goers rather than people that are genuinely saved, um, you know, because that's what the extremity is really not on. You know, we are called, you know, if we're genuinely saved, there's a, there's a life to be lived. We're called to behave in a particular way. We're called to, 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 to read the word, digest it and apply it to our lives. Um, therefore, if we're doing that, um, we're proving something and that's very important. And that's the whole heart of this, this, this reasons for faithfulness, that's where I'm, you know, I'm coming from with that. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll be looking at a number of, uh, a number of uh, headings on that basis um, with the, the overall reasons for faithfulness, but we'll see as we get there where, how, 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 how um, uh, I portion that. As I said before, there's some points that actually can cover and have been covered before, but I did say when I, was, uh, begin, when I began this series that some of it would turn up again later on, but we we'll look at it in greater detail when it turns up subsequently under some of these other headings. So some of the stuff that I'm going through today will be kind of developing a little bit more some of what I just alighted on briefly in the past. And as I said before, of course, although I've got far fewer scriptures to refer to, um, there are many, many more scriptures and some of them you'll be very aware of that uh, I haven't referred to or flagged up, which, um, which can be used to highlight the point or uh, points that are being made tonight. So we're going to start off, obviously, as I said, with this reading. 1 Peter 1, verses 15 through 19. Um, 1 Peter 1, 15 through 19. <clears throat> he said, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So he's reminding them of that the, there is that need to live holy lives. Yeah, the reason to live according to his word, his commands, his instructions and guidance. It is all about being and doing what he has called us to do and be. Yeah, it's very, very important. Yeah. Reason for faithfulness, uh, we are called to walk a walk. We are called to live a life. We are called to act in a particular way in all circumstances. And uh, there is that reality, of course, that living faithfully shows that we love him. So if we're living faithfully, it shows that we love him. We want to please him and that we are keen to show our loyalty and gratefulness for what he has done. In many respects, these are obviously headline or summarial reasons as are the scriptures that we've looked at before, like 1 John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands, or Ephesians 4, 1, walk worthy of your calling. So therefore, we obviously need some detail of what that life lived out accordingly, uh, according to what we've been called. Again, as I said before, we've already gone over some of these practicalities, but today we're focusing 
especially on the why we must be faithful uh, and we must faithfully stand in and with him and stand on his word of course we've already looked, read through 1 Peter 1 be ye holy for I am holy but also there's a couple of other passages that have uh, highlighted um, as we look at that, as we, say, as we look at a little bit more into depth of what does it mean to, to, to be holy? Now, a little bit more into depth is, is what I'm saying here. It's not about that. This, this whole matter of holiness really needs a sermon all of its own because it is such an important thing. So in reality, we're just going to be touching on this as we look at, at what we are called to be in terms of, of, of conduct, in terms of who we are uh, or who we are to be. Um, what, the first scripture we're going to look at, we're, still, we're in Peter, and this is what we were like. This is detailing what we were like. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 to 5. 1 Peter 4, verses 3 to 5. It reads, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime, note that, past lifetime, in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So he's writing here to these, to these Christians and he's saying, remember what you used to be like. We acknowledge what we used to be like before we knew him. But now we're called to this holy living. We can't go on like this. And the thing is, those who, we've, who are, 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 whether it be friends or family or associates, who, want, who knew what we were once like, <laughs> because we don't no longer do these things or we won't participate in these things that they readily do, uh, they see, this year has been a bit weird, this is a bit strange, and some will go to the extent of actually badmouthing us because of the fact that we are now different, we no longer do this as believers, we cannot be part and parcel of it. Some will do that. But he says, in effect, <laughs> don't be bothered, don't be phased by this sort of thing. The fact that they're bad-mouthing you, the fact that they think you're strange, the fact that they think you're weird. He says, because at the end of the day, they will give an account to God. They will answer to God. It's very, very important that we, we grasp that. So well, part of the reason for us being faithful in our walk is we are now being called to that newness, newness of life. We have a standard that we have to live by, which means turning our backs on some of these things that we formerly did before we knew him. Um, and we mustn't make any apology for being for being like that and not be not at all be faced not at all be uh, bothered by the fact that those who are unsaved take umbrage with us over that in ephesians 4 we go to that reading verse ephesians chapter 4 verses 17 through 19 gives us a bit more about what we are to be this i say therefore and testify in the lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all on cleanliness with greediness. That we were part and parcel of, as Peter writes, we are no longer to be like that. There are these things that get gone in the world, there are the things that the world do, there are the things that some of our friends and our family or unsaved do that we cannot be part and parcel of. We move away from that. We've been called to living holy lives. God did not call us to uncleanliness, but, he, but in holiness. That's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. I'm just quoting part of the first there, of course. He did not call us to uncleanliness, but he called us in holiness. He called us to holiness. There must be holiness in our conduct. We have been set apart for and to God from the kingdom of darkness and all its corruption. 
we can be our active participants in that which God has forbidden and condemned. The seriousness of this is emphasized by Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 where it reads, Without holiness no one shall see God. Our behavior must match our confession. There must be a hunger for godliness and holiness and righteousness. Even though we fail at times, because we don't live perfectly, we don't live out that life perfectly, we may fail at times, and we do fail at times, but when we fail there should be sorrow, and there must be sorrow, not just should be, there must be sorrow, there must be repentance, there must be a strong desire to get back in step with God. It's an absolute must, and that goes some way to proving who we, uh, whose we really are and who we really are. We must be faithful in our walk. Now, some weeks, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, I uh, referred, I think that's about a prayer meeting, it may have been a men's meeting, I suspect it's a prayer, main prayer meeting, to an article that was on uh, one of the news channels. In fact, we came in on a Sunday evening and we do quite like watching that news channel because I find there's a good, there's a good variety of things on there and opinions and so on and so forth. Uh, but we switched the TV on and there was obviously someone who was, get, who was a guest on one of these um, uh, current affairs programs having a rant about Christians and Christianity. Um, uh, the most miserable people that he, 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 he knew. Um, you know, and I said at that meeting that I'd heard this claim, this claim many times over the years. Uh, but the reality is what they really mean when they call us miserable is something of what Peter has alluded to. What they really mean is we don't join in or, or laugh at their coarse talk and their coarse behaviour, nor do we applaud their sinful indulgence. Yeah, we don't readily laugh or applaud their sin. And to right, we should not. You know, if the, that passage in Ephesians we read and that passage in, in, in Peter makes that abundantly clear. We're not to participate in it and we're not to applaud it either. You know, we are a serious people, though. That, I would say, we are a serious people. We're not miserable people, but we are a serious people. There's a bit of a difference there. You know, how can we not be a serious people in the light of God's Word? Remember verse 5 of that, that passage in 1 Peter. They are going to give an account to Him. We've got all this stuff that God has said. You know, don't be part of that, Christian. Don't be part of that. And the people that are part of that, they will give an account to him. And we really remember that. Remember judgment is coming. So we have to be a serious people. We are a serious people. We're aware of what's coming. The world might be blind to it in large part, but we're not. We don't apologize for being a serious people. But we do know how to laugh and we do know how to smile. Mostly at the right things, I would say. You know, I've had a conversation with uh, Brother Nick some weeks ago and I said, uh, you know, I know as a Christian sometimes we laugh at sin. We should never laugh at sin because sin sent Christ to the cross. But, you know, again, we're imperfect. Sometimes we find things that go off which we shouldn't find funny because God doesn't find them funny. We do laugh at them, if we're honest. But that should be very few and far between and we should endeavour never to laugh at it. Because as I say, don't forget, it's because of sin that Christ went to the cross. We do know how to laugh and smile. So at the end of the day, that charge is false. And it's time to dismiss it. When you hear someone turn around and say, oh, Christians are so miserable, blah, 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 blah. Well, I switched the TV off. I just heard this guy beginning his rant. I just said, he's talking nonsense. I do not want to hear this. Off it went. And, you know, sometimes when that's the reaction we want to have, you know, we don't engage. Uh, remember what our Lord said, you know, don't cast your pearls before swine. And don't give what's holy to the dogs. Discern that. Discern the moment. There's sometimes when it's good to talk, it's good to challenge. But there are times when, you know what? I ain't talking to you. Mm -hmm. I ain't talking to you. Walk away. There are people now in a lost eternity and there are people all the time going into a lost eternity every moment of, this, of the day who are not laughing. 
the unbeliever might think it's all funny in the here and now, but when they get into eternity, they ain't laughing anymore. The current crop of unbelievers that are currently alive, they go on into eternity unrepentant. They ain't going to be laughing either. And Luke 16 verse 19 onwards, the rich man and Lazarus brings the gravity of their situation into focus. Remember, we all know that, been taught, we've, we've seen that preached on or referred to many a time over the years. The rich man, he had the, the bounty of all this world had to offer. <laughs> And he didn't get tuppence for the beggar that was getting the crumbs at his, at his table. The beggar was a godly man, uh, but the rich man was godless. He had the best of this world and he went into a lost eternity because he had no time for God. But wow, well, didn't he wake up when he, went and he got into eternity? But it was too late. It was too late. And he realized what to the point where he wanted uh, someone sent to warn his brothers not to come to this place that he'd come to and to turn to God in effect, repent while they had that chance. But that reveals the gravity of that situation. The people that are laughing at sin, that are indulging in sin, that are having a whale of the time, this is as good as it gets for them. This is as good as it gets and they ain't going to be laughing when they enter into eternity. The other thing we need to consider as well when we when we endeavour to walk faithfully with God, with what God has called us to. Remember the same people who want you to join in their dissipation are the ones who would quickly condemn you as a hypocrite when you do. Mm. Oh, they want you to, to applaud what they're doing. They want you to participate in But they know you're a church goer. If they know you're a professed Christian, they'll soon be calling you behind your back because oh, they want you to do it but when you start doing it when you start giving in when you start compromising they'll call you and remember what Peter said in that passage they'll call you because you're not participating uh, they'll call you if you participate oh well isn't he supposed to be you know friends not fall for that not fall for that don't fall for that they'll do it mostly behind your back as Peter highlights so living to fit in with their expectations is foolish. It's foolish. Don't do it. You know, and one of the things we do need to, I know the young people aren't here tonight, but you know, as parents, as grandparents, as people who, who do know young people in the wider family, you know, particularly people, young people at a church, we, particularly but not exclusively, we need to encourage them to resist peer pressure, what we know to be godless, what we know to be evil peer pressure. I mean, because in my experience, even unbelieving friends and associates who really matter, we need to get that across to, to young people. You know, the friends, the school friends, the associates, people that really matter will typically more likely respect them, respect their stance. There's that principle there, it's an important principle. Stand, stand, on, stand on the ground, stand, stand, Stand on the solid ground of God's word. Stand on what you know to be right. And you, the people that really matter are more likely to respect you. Don't worry about getting the respect because you won't get it from those who, who, don't, who don't matter. If, they, if, if they're genuinely like you, if they're genuinely your friend, they will respect the diff They will respect your stance. And we need to encourage young people with that um, as well. That godless peer pressure should be, needs to be, needs to be uh, resisted. Turn away from it. And Matthew 5.15 tells us to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Be primarily concerned with God, what God thinks and says since ultimately he will vindicate us. Proverbs 16 verse 7 also says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. You know, there's another important principle there that should encourage us to stand, stand firmly, stand firmly on the word of God. You know, we're called to be salt and light. You know, we're light, allowing, letting our deeds be seen. Holy deeds, deeds that glorify God, let them be seen. People will notice and they will glorify. You know, there will be the idiots who, don't, who will mock, but there will be those who, who, will, who will acknowledge and, uh, and uh, applaud. And they're the ones that really matter at the end of the day. Don't be, don't be phased by the fools. I've used that term in the past. Don't be phased by the fools. Because at the end of the day, ultimately, they will give an account to him, as we saw in, in 1 Peter. 
be primarily concerned with what God thinks and what God says. He will ultimately vindicate us. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge both the living and the dead. Faithfulness in holiness proves who we truly are and will cause us to turn away from sin. As the scripture says again, for without holiness, no one shall see God. Also, faithfulness to God's word. It's important to be faithful to God's word. Be faithful to his truth. You know, I thought while I sat there this morning, Darren was talking about this, you know, oh, so true. You know, this is reliable. This word of God, it's the very word of God. It's reliable. It is, it is, it is, it is there to give us all that we need uh, as, as believers. It speaks to all of humanity, but particularly, of course, for those of us who are believers, it is particularly important. We need to be faithful to it. If, it goes, if God says it, then we believe it. If God said it, then we say it. And we stand by it. We don't, we don't water it down. We don't mess about with it to, to tickle the, the ears of people. And that is a grave responsibility when someone comes here and, and, and stands uh, and brings, brings a word and preaches. You know, we've got to be faithful to the word of God. Why? Because it's absolutely important. If we're not faithful to that, if we twist it, if we bend it, if we mess about with it to appeal to the ears of the, of the godless, thinking that we're going to we're going to cause them to want to know Him, we're, we're terribly mistaken. We are sadly mistaken. Because at the end of the day, when we're faithful to God's word, it will cause the unsaved to take our words seriously. When we start bending it to fit in with what they expect, what's the point? the end of the day. If it's that elastic, it's not going to do anything for them. That's one of the biggest mistakes that's made in, in many, many areas of Christendom today. Is uh, well, we live in modern times. Things have moved on. It's the 21st century. Has God changed? No. Saying yesterday, today and forever, what he says stands. And we shouldn't twist it. We shouldn't twist it to accommodate the current line of thinking in this perverse society, in this fallen world. Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 7, which we're not going to, I'm just mentioning it. We, we, hear, we have here a statement made where about him being a watchman. Now it's interesting, of course, we, we're all, I think most of us are aware historically of the role of watchmen, standing guard on the city walls, looking out for danger, going to ring the bell, sound the trumpet, whatever it is they have, to, uh, not to, 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 to announce that an enemy was on the way, uh, on the way to attack. So you've, you've, of course you've got the, the, the typical historical, practical aspect of, uh, of that referring to someone who's, who's warning of impending attack. But scripture does use it in a spiritual sense as well. That's there in Ezekiel, but it's also in Hebrews, um, the 13th chapter, verse 17, where it's used about leaders being spiritual watchmen for those that they have charge overseeing, uh, over, be overseeing uh, within the church setting, watching out for their souls, making sure that people are, are, on, are staying on the straight and narrow and not, are not straying. They're called to that responsibility. But then there's also passages that speak of the wider church being watchmen, sounding out the alarm. Not only making sure that we're walking as we should be walking, but ready to sound out the alarm to the unsaved world out there as well, warning them of what they face. Uh, that could be found in Mark 14 and also Luke, um, Luke, Luke 12. I've, written down there, but that's, yeah, Luke chapter 12, I'm struggling to see exactly what I wrote. Uh, but the bottom line is that that, that um, principle is there within the New Testament. It's about, it's, there is a, spirit, a spiritual aspect to that. But with the role of, of watchmen, as I've said before, it's important that when we, we stand on God's word, we're standing on the whole counsel of God. Acts 20 verse 27, and this is uh, Paul speaking to the elders there at, in Ephesians, at, in, at Ephesus. Uh, and he says, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. If you're standing there, if you're witnessing, if you're standing here, if you're witnessing to people, you, you've got to deliver the whole counsel of God to them. You, you can't, we cannot afford to give people things in part. 
uh, just again to tickle their ears, just again to make them feel all right. We'll tell them the good bits, but we won't be so ready to tell them the not so good things. Or well, hang on, the not so good things are very, very important for them to hear. You know, the good thing is uh, ultimately Christ has come to save. The not so good is you're going to be judged if you don't get saved, if you don't turn to him, if you don't accept him as your saviour. There's a saying that, uh, that's been around for a while. If you won't accept him as your saviour, you will have him as your judge. We deliver the full counsel of God, whether you're standing here or whether you're out there just witnessing on a one-to-one -one basis. The full counsel of God at all times to people. If we don't deliver the full counsel of God, we're failing. And it's a dereliction of duty. It's a dereliction of duty of the one who's here. It's a dereliction of duty when you're witnessing to someone if you're not delivering them the full counsel of God out there. And it doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter what the people sat in the pews think. As a minister, as, a pre as someone who's bringing the word, it's a dereliction of duty. It doesn't matter what they think. If you're bringing them God's word, that's all that matters. The rest of it's between them and God. If you're witnessing to someone out there, I'm witnessing to some out, someone out there, it doesn't matter what they think at the end of the day. It's, they can accept or reject, but we deliver the full counsel of God. So on that day, for though, you know, imagine the anguish of people, the people, people that we fail, when we fail to do this, when, we, when we're not honest, totally honest, when we go for the tickling of ears, we need to remember on that day, as, Peter, as 1 Peter 4, 5 points out, when they're judged, when they're called to give an account, when they're called to answer to him, you know, what, how, how horrible it will be for people uh, to have been misled by statements made to appease their ears rather than they're being told the truth. And that's one of the things that we've got to carry with us at the end of the day. We speak the truth, we set the example because at the end of the day there is a final accountability to come. And that accountability includes us as well, standing before the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll get into that a little later on. So let's not fail on account of a false sense or false application of compassion because that's a lot of what goes on today. Oh, you're not being compassionate. Oh, you're being offensive by saying that. My friend, at the end of the day, they ain't going to thank you. They ain't going to thank you for your compassion if you fail to tell them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of what God has laid down. We must not emphasize the love of Christ in good works and service, feeding the poor, feeding the hungry, and all the rest of it as we, we, we see in the gospel. We, don't, we must emphasize that at the expense of warning to escape the wrath of God that is coming upon this world. We've got to get both. We've got to do both. As much as we do the one where we're seeing to those who are in need, we've also got to be ones that are also warning to the very ones in need of their greater need for the gospel, of their greater need to turn to God. Because at the end of the day, all we're doing, if, if, if that's all we are doing, if that's all a church is doing, is it's out there with its soup kitchens and the light and the rest, great and wonderful as these things are, but if that's all they're doing, and there's no attempt to actually tell people about the fact that they need a saviour, all you're doing is giving them a more comfortable road to hell. That's all we're doing. We want the world to be, we, we need to be faithful because we want the world to believe, whether it be family, friends, workmates, neighbours, etc. Uh, again, as the passage says, let our light shine. Light has to shine, salt has to be applied in order to be effective. We may, you may never be called to take the front stage to preach in church or on the street corner, but we can all live and witness one-to-one. -one. Witnessing one-to-one is the most effective way to, to, to share the gospel. Uh, I, because it's often relational. You know the person and you've done it, you're doing it over a period of time. Um, so quite often it's, it's, it's very effective. When people come to Christ that way, they usually come and, and, they, hang, and they, they stay the course. 
deeper because they've had that relation that's been built up and all and the, the sharing that's been done over time. Um, problem with people that are uh, being saved at some of these big events, the Crusades and what have you, is many of them, it's a flash in the pan thing and they soon walk away after. And that's been shown by survey after survey. So you may never be called to, to preach from the front at the end of the day, one to one with that friend, with that neighbour, with that member of the family. It's often the most effective way of reaching someone for the Lord. And we need to remember as well, if we're praying for someone's salvation, we set an example. We live the life that is setting an example before them in order to attract them. You know, it's part and parcel of our responsibility. We've got to live that life that's God honouring. We're praying for people's salvation, we've got to live that life that's God honouring. And it's uh, not water, we're not watering down the scripture because at the end of the day that's more likely to attract them to the things of Christ. That's more likely to attract them to the Lord. From our perspective, that is, of course. That ultimately, it's God who saves. We understand that and accept that. But that mystery of that, that, if you like, dance where we speak to people and what the work that God does in their life, what the work that God does in their heart. You know, the same, the same, the same uh, has been said many, many years ago, that the church is never more attractive to the world than when it's most different from the world. We're praying for salvation, set that example. Don't compromise. Honour God with our lives and our lifestyle. Be obedient to him as he's called us to be. Let our light shine. Be light. Be salt. Someone also said some time ago, if you pray for a harvest, God ex expects you to say amen with the hoe. <laughs> That's very true. You know, sow, plant, sow, water. Set that example. That's all part and parcel of that. But it's God that gives the growth again. <laughs> something that we don't understand we don't but we're called to do that we're called to play our part we, how it works out between god and them that's that's another thing altogether but we're called to play our part living faithfully walking in holiness standing on the word also means that we avoid the credibility gap before both the world and fellow christians Again, we're talking about the whole thing here around the, this, this matter of, of, of hypocrisy. You know, call ourselves Christians, but at the end of the day, if we're doing things and we're behaving in a way that's completely contrary to what Scripture is saying, it's not really setting the example that we ought to be setting. Again, we do not live perfectly. We don't follow him perfectly, but that's a different thing. Um, you know, when, we talk, when I talk about or highlight things like the credibility gap, we're talking about things that are so out of, out of order, they stand out on their own. I think it was Moody that uh, was once said of that, uh, he was encountered um, by a drunk uh, uh, having been to a meeting and uh, this person in his inebriated state said to him, oh, you're, you're deal Moody, aren't you? And uh, he said, yes. I'm one of your followers. And Moody looking at him said, you must be. You can't be one of the Lord's. <laughs> you know, we don't live perfectly, but at the end of the day, you know, there is a life. There is a lifestyle. There is something that, that, gives, uh, that gives away the fact that we are truly God's. And it's about them following Christ, not following us, because we feel we're fallible at the end of the day, always pointing towards Christ. And we endeavor to live out as we've been called to live out. Remember also, with, even with the best example set from the human perspective in terms of our life lived be before man, um, that there's no guarantee that people will take heed. 1 Samuel chapter 8, despite their notably god godly father, Samuel's sons turned out evil. Couldn't have had much of a better example from a human perspective, could they? And yet, they turned out evil. And of course, our Lord himself was rejected by most in his day. Faithfulness to and with the God-given talents for service within the church. We've got, to, we've got to be faithful to the talents that he's given us. He's given us that we might be of service within the church, serving one another and serving him, glorifying him, bringing glory to him. 
Romans 12, Corinthians 12 gives us something of a, of a, of a rundown of that. But we're never off duty. So whilst we're giving these gifts in the first instance to, to serve in church or within a church setting, we're never off duty. And uh, again, we can still use our gifts to glorify God uh, when we're out there ministering, ministering among the lost. Again, that passage, let your light so shine before men, I think pretty much confirms that. Our lives, our works, and so on and so forth. Using those gifts to serve God. So it's within the church and without the church we're, we're using those gifts. That lifestyle is not about putting just that Sunday face, that Sunday attitude on. It's about all week long. Living that life. And of course, you know, the, the gifts vary. As I said before, you may not be caught, you may not be gifted to come up here and speak. But I think Psalm 84 verse 10 is the one that really puts that, to, puts that into perspective as to how we should uh, consider what we do for God in terms of our gifting. Where he says, he would rather be, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Yeah, if God's called you to be a God, uh, doorkeeper, be a great doorkeeper called you to be a, a host and we have some host people that are very good at hospitality be, be the best hospitable person that you can be he's called you to to preach his word do that to the best of the ability that he's given you he's called you to, to be someone who cleans that's very very important do that to the glory of God tidy it up outside do that to the glory of God whatever it is uh, do it to the glory of God don't be one who's I, I want to be out there I want to I want to be right there in the center of it um, having the supposedly or seemingly more uh, whiz bango gifts, so to speak, for want of a better, better way of putting it. Don't beware of, 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 of the seeking after preeminence. Why? Because at the end of the day, uh, of our ultimate accountability to God. Now, Esther chapter 4, verse 14, that's used so many times, and again, you, I think we're all pretty familiar with that. I've even used that myself where we, you know, Mordecai speaking to Esther reminds her you know, when, when she's hesitant about going into the situation uninvited of seeing the king because she could have been put away. Uh, we, know that, we know the story well. Or she could even have been executed because going in there uninvited uh, was quite a serious offence. And she, she kind of wavered about going off and doing that. And yeah. but Mordecai makes it very clear to her, how, you know, who, who knows, but you have been put in that position of being, of being queen for such a time as this, having to go into the king unannounced and petition for your people over this dastardly plan that was in that was in the offing, and we use that. Uh, we need to be careful because we use it quite a lot. Uh, that there, that that this verse doesn't become something of a trite, throwaway soundbite. Do you really grasp the danger Esther was in? When Mordecai warned her, I've explained it already. Do you really grasp it? Do we really grasp it? So, do we really grasp what we are actually saying when we say that, when we make that sort of comparison? If we are to stand on such a statement, we have to grasp the reality, which means we are making a stand for the things of God at a time when all manner of issues have come up against us. We are making a stand in time and in a place and in a situation that could be even dangerous to us, but certainly would be challenging. We live in a day where truth has been turned on its head, good call evil, evil call good, all manner of sinful behaviours explained away, some of it even justified by professed Christians, much false teaching and a reluctance to call out so-called Christian superstars who by their very words and deeds demonstrate they know not God. An age when you'll be called intolerant if you simply state God's truth instead of bowing to the mindset of the age. Has God placed you here and now to counter the godless agenda of this age in whatever small or significant way? If you truly believe, if we truly believe that we are here for such a time as this, then we need to act accordingly. We need to stand accordingly. What's the part that God's calling you to play at this time? Will you play it? 
Are you prepared to stick your head above the parapet, so to speak? Will you? And finally, faithfulness important to the task, to the life as a whole that we've been called to because we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the bema of Christ, as it's called, as, to use the original term, Greek term. This should sober up those who desire preeminence. Remember in James 3 1, he warns about this since he says those who are teachers will face a tougher judgment, a tougher evaluation of their work, their lives, the responsibilities that they've been given. It should also sober up those who seek after experiences. Again, we have so much that we've said over the years about. I say even in recent months about the, 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 the extremes of the charismatic movement. You know, there are people out there seeking experiences and they believe they've had an experience from God and so on and so forth. Well, if it truly is an experience from God, beware. Again, because that saying that Christ highlighted, unto whom much is given. Leadership, experience, unto whom much is given. God has done something fantastic in your life, unto whom much is given, much is expected. That comes very much into play. I keep saying this, but it's a, it's a warning that we all need to take heed of. Whether you call to preach or whatever, much given, much expected. And of course, the bema of Christ we must not confuse with the great white throne judgment of uh, Revelation. That is a judgment of the lost. The judgment seat is for the saved. It's giving an account of our life service to God. And it's one of the things that I've noticed over the years in church is that, that this, this bema of Christ is kind of treated with a, a degree of, it's not, I wouldn't use the word contempt, but it's this degree, treated with a degree of familiarity, for want of a better word. People that speak of it I've found over the years, I'm not saying here and here now or recently, who just seem to think it's going to be one big jolly where rewards are handed out. Friends, it's not. It's not. It's a judgment seat. Our works, our life for Christ is going to be examined. It's going to be examined in detail. It's going to be tested by fire. As by fire, as it says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 through, uh, through uh, 15. And he goes on to say, at which some will suffer loss. Salvation is not in question here. It's a judgment of the saved. And it's saying some will suffer loss. What will that loss be? I don't know. It doesn't go into detail. But that loss will be real. It will hurt. And read that passage. Sadly, some Christians, it must be said, and let that not be us, let that not be us, brethren, are living carelessly. And maybe they're just assembling material for the biggest bonfire ever. We don't want to be people where our works are burnt up to the point where there's nothing when it's tested by fire. We want to be people where there's that little nugget of gold. Maybe bigger for some, maybe smaller for others. Well, it certainly will be. But we want to be one where there's that, 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 that. That thing that remains, which says that is of value, something that will last during our lives here. Let that not be us sending material up for the greatest bonfire ever. So in finishing, finally in summary, we've been called to a marvellous new life in Christ. It involves certain responsibilities toward God and each other. We have guidance on how to handle difficulties and are called and urged to be faithful to his words, to his commands. We can't know that word unless we study and read it. Again, what Darren highlighted this morning, study it, read it, take note of it. We can't know what it says unless we do that. Only by this will, will we see through the false because there's a lot of faults with that there, and avoid the shifting political and social narratives of today. I can't I, enough said on that, because I think you know you're all very aware of some of what's going off and what Christians are being suckered into. Yeah. 
We can allow ourselves to be shaped by the world around us or by the word within us. I borrowed that quote off of a Christian publication that I read recently. We can allow ourselves to be shaped by the world around us or by the word within us. Mindful that God the Father sent Christ the Son to die for us when he had every right to give up on us. He owed us nothing. We owe him everything. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for who you are and all that you have done. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do want to thank you for your word this evening. Lord, I just pray that every, every aspect of it, all that you want us to take in, Lord, will alight on our hearts. Lord, help us to have had ears that would hear, hearts that would be open to, and minds to chew over, to, 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 to go, to gnaw over the things, as the scripture says, that you've put before us this evening. And to be people that are encouraged, Lord, because at the end of the day, we want to be encouraged. Yes, there's a warning. There are warnings there. But there's also encouragement to remember that ultimately it's the word of God that we're to stand on. It's the Word of God. When we stand on the Word of God, it doesn't matter how difficult things get, we will be vindicated ultimately. So help us, Lord, to be strong on your Word, to be strong in the things of God, to stand firm on the things of God, to be courageous, to be faithful in all that you have given us to do in this life. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.